It's great to be here with you today. And uh, uh, the information so far reminds me of uh, how physicians, I think, have been behind the curve on this. The National Coalition of Cancer Survivors as an organization was formed in 1986. The first time the word survivor appeared in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is the main professional uh, literature for oncologists in the United States and in the world, was 2002. So physicians have been behind the, the uh, curve in terms of learning about, discussing, and incorporating survivorship issues into the care of patients. Uh, I'm reminded uh, from this morning's conversation that early in my career, which started in the, in the late 1980s, I had a very strict medical model of care for patients, and uh, I really thought that treatment ended with the last dose of chemotherapy, and that they were done, they'll be better in a week or two, and that was it. And that was my thinking as a young physician in, in the late 1980s, and I know that I've come a long way since that time, fortunately, for myself, for my patients, and, and because uh, society has changed and because our priorities have changed and we've learned a lot for, for, the, for the better. So I currently practice at one of the locations of Rocky Mountain Cancer Centers in uh, Colorado. We have, I think, about 60 physicians and I think about 14 locations. Um, and we're, the, I believe, the largest provider of cancer care in the state of Colorado. Uh, we're community oncologists. We do have genetic counselors, and I think we have nine social workers in our organization. Uh, and so we, we practice with a centralized network, and we've been fortunate to incorporate a lot of, I think, forward thinking in our care of patients, of which I'll talk a little bit about, and then talk about uh, some interests of mine more recently, and leave you with all a few thoughts uh, that I would see as a medical oncologist as to where, where to go. Um, um, we have in our program throughout our network um, a program that's called Love Heals. And we really have this belief that survivorship needs start with the very first visit and how a center throughout their care cares for that patient throughout treatment. And about four years ago, throughout our network, we came up with a, a slogan, a logo, and an advertising campaign that is called Love Heals. And it's been throughout our, sev our several centers. It's been in major advertisements. You can find it on the bus that drives by in the mass transit system throughout the state. And it really has been also an internal campaign that we've got to be the best we can for our patients. And so it's been both an internal and external drive to do the best we can for our patients and to provide not just care, but caring for our patients. And it really has been a, a very spirited model of improving the way we deliver care. And these are some of the slogans within our advertising campaign. I love Heals, it's at the core of what we do. It's how we care about you, not just for you. Love, love's healing power starts where the clinical science leaves off and love that level of care makes all the difference in the world. And these are some of the mottos and slogans that we've used in our external advertising campaign, but also internalized to try to pro provide uh, a sense of caring that goes beyond just the clinical science and the <coughs> delivery of the IV. Uh, we've developed a program throughout our network that's called What's Next? And this is approximately a one-hour program that's done at our centers, and it comes at a time when patients are done with their active treatment. And it also includes a summary treatment care plan and, and summary guide of uh, treatment provided. And it's a single one-hour session. Uh, it covers the expectations, post-treatment, recovery, and the acute side effects that patients can expect. And then it's also an intertwining of what to expect from one's primary care provider and follow-up oncology care, and it acknowledges the fears and anxieties of treatment uh, as patients go beyond the acute treatment. And this would be a one-hour session. We have programs in our centers uh, that are as short as one hour and as long as seven weeks that we'll talk about next. And so we really do offer the spectrum of survivorship care within our network. We offer this program that was written by uh, Dr. Jeremy Geffen, who's a retired medical oncologist who in his own practice realized the psychosocial uh, and ramifications of treatment and he developed something called the seven levels. 
and it's really quite uh, an uh, uh, undertaking for centers to develop this and provide this. But we've done this in, I think, nine of our treatment centers now for the past four years. We put hundreds of patients through this program, and it is a curriculum of a textbook and seven two-hour sessions, uh, all very purposeful, structured, run by a trained social worker and a trained oncology nurse from each center. And in most of our centers, it runs consecutively. Seven sessions are finished, and then the next seven begins. And thought to be best for patients as they're close to ending treatment or done with treatment as a seven session uh, enterprise when they're ready to start thinking about their future. And the premise is that there are seven steps needed to reconcile cancer and organize one's life post-treatment. And these seven levels, and each one is covered by a separate one-week session, two-hour session, are education and information, uh, connection with others, the body as a garden, emotional healing, the nature of mind, life assessment, and the nature of spirit. And in a very organized session, it does take people through this uh, seven-week journey. That is much of what's been talked about already today, but in a very structured format. And it's a very powerful tool that we've done research on with outcomes, and, and patients feel very much uh, benefited by the treatment. Their anxieties are down. They've improved their, their thought and thinking. Their quality of life has improved. So we will continue to, to use this in our uh, survivorship model throughout Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. Uh, and it's been an expensive undertaking for us, but one that we're dedicated to. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about a, a realization that I came to earlier this year in terms of uh, really what, what, what is needed in the community, not only in my individual practice, but, but at a larger medical oncology community and how uh, different aspects of oncology professionals interact with each other and uh, how we interact with primary care providers. And so I came to understand in my journey as to what's needed, uh, this research that was produced uh, through a grant from the American Cancer Society and published in the journal Cancer a couple of years ago. And it looked at a survey of 400 primary care physicians throughout the United States, and it, it polled those practices as to what's their understanding of survivorship care uh, in patients finished treatment who were their charges as primary care providers. And the startling statistic to me was that only 24% of primary care providers delivered adequate multidimensional survivorship care. And that only 50% of primary care providers felt that they had any training to provide survivorship care. And that 80% of primary care providers felt that we did not define what survivorship care should be a standard of care. And so from this, I said, geez, there's this huge gap between how we care for patients as medical oncologists with our oncology nurses and navigators, et cetera, and how the patient is cared for when they're back in their primary community, uh, physician setting or healthcare setting. And I think all of you are aware that there's very much a movement of patients to be moved back to primary care follow-up earlier and earlier, and a knowledge that probably patients will see less and less of their oncology facilities uh, post-treatment because of the rising demand of acute care for, for uh, oncology patients and the shrinking supply of, of oncology providers throughout the United States. So there really is an increasing demand that primary care providers be aware of and take care of uh, survivors at an earlier juncture in time. And as you see here, a huge knowledge. So my observations were that, uh, and, and people told me that my primary care provider doesn't understand my cancer, doesn't understand my treatment, doesn't understand my unique issues and needs. You know, I can recall patients who told me that their primary care provider didn't know the difference between tamoxifen and taxol. And, and, and how were they to understand their long-term toxicities with that? And I also found that patients, as they talked uh, to me, 
said, I don't know where to turn for, to survivorship programs. There's so many out there, I don't know what they offer, I get lost in looking for them. Okay. And I've come to the realization, and I think this meeting brings to that point, that oncologists, physicians, social workers, nurses, navigators in our field all have our own separate little silos of literature and we don't share them. And I see that as an issue in terms of what's needed. So I've come up with this year uh, an organization that's called the Pink Ribbon Survivors Network. And it will have three missions within it and we're in our point of developing our website have built a board and, and are going forward putting together our model of our organization. And it will be a comprehensive online source for primary care providers to learn of breast cancer treatment and the unique needs and issues of that survivor so that the provider could come to our site and learn what was the treatment, what are the side effects, what are the long-term ramifications, what's the standard of care follow-up, and understand those issues from one single site. Because I truly believe that, that we talk about serving the underserved and who the underserved are, I think the underserved is anyone if their health care provider is undereducated. And therefore, it's not socioeconomic, but it's the education of the provider that really defines uh, the undereducated and the underserved population. And our logo there with our, our uh, motto is community education, recovery, and growth. Uh, also, we are going to provide in our site a service directory for breast cancer survivorship programs. There's so many programs out there. Life Beyond Cancer is one of them. It's hard to navigate uh, to find which those are and what they are and what they offer. And we're going to be uh, the hub with many spokes and give a brief summary of what the different ones are and how to uh, find those and what they offer in particular so that a patient could come to us and find all the different programs out there and have an understanding of what they're looking for and what they can gain from each one. So we'll be the Expedia for breast cancer survivorship programs and interact with all of them. And also we're building a, a site of a curriculum for recovery. And so we're going to have readings, essays that will help patients along their journey with many of the issues we've talked about today so that they can, can uh, heal along their journey from treatment uh, through gaining uh, their goals in life. And then also we're going to develop a virtual online library and we're going to take the survivorship literature and breast cancer survivorship from the perspective of the physician, the oncology nurse, the oncology social worker and the navigator and bring it to one virtual free library so that we can collaborate as physicians, as social workers, as nurses, as oncology navigators and share one literature. I've learned so much just in the assembly of this literature from uh, my colleagues, social workers, and others who brought literature as we're assembling it. And really, we, got, we can all learn from this by learning from each other. And right now, all of our literature sits separate. I mean, we, how many physicians access the social work literature or vice versa? It'll be a great tool to have this as a free source and have this updated constantly as an online library of care. And I'll leave with, uh, I think, five points that I consider key from the perspective of a medical oncologist. Uh, and I would ask a cancer survivor and providers who look after them to think of these five questions and issues. Number one, what is the future of my health and how can the medical system support the best outcome? Number two, how can I best take care of myself? Number three, what are my priorities for myself, my family, and those most important to me? Number four, after cancer, what am I looking to accomplish? And number five, what legacy do I want to leave? Thank you.